Hi, I'm Alex. And I'm Eddie. Welcome to the 20th episode of Catch 52, a politics podcast brought to you by WDSR Duquesne Student Radio. We are now 30 weeks away from Inauguration Day 2021 and back from our impromptu uh, break. Um, Our impromptu break. (laughs) My impromptu break. But uh, regardless, we um, are back just in time because President Gormley has released a second statement about, oh, that's right. Uh, Just like Drew Black Brees, Matter. he's trying to come back around on the other side. He's going for the rare uh, second statement strategy. So, uh, you know, let's do what we do and yeah. see see how it went. Yeah. So the last statement was decidedly neutral on pretty much everything. And as we stated, being neutral on civil rights is not being neutral at all, but in fact, uh, being on the side of the oppressor as the quote goes. And if so, you really want to be walked through that in greater detail, we have an episode on that. It's actually yes. our last episode. Go watch our last episode. Yeah. So if you haven't seen our last episode or listened to our last episode, listen to it. And if you have, then welcome. So um, this is Ken's statement. We are screen sharing it for those on YouTube. For those not, we'll also be reading it. Um, so this is dated June 19th, so six days ago. A rather auspicious June 19th. Yes. So, yeah, just first paragraph. On June 19th, 2020, Duquesne University... Actually, wait. That's the uh, That's actually just the, the <laughs> header for the letter. All right, here we so, go. Dear Duquesne University community, over the last few weeks since the inexcusable death of George Floyd in Minneapolis, as well as the additional tragic circumstances that led to the deaths of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and too many others, a host of students, faculty, and alumni have contacted me and others at the university with questions. Not only are they asking about the well-being of students and our faculty and staff, they are asking more urgently, what does Duquesne plan to do? All right, so um, inexcusable death is definitely better than um, unspeakable tragedy, Uh, but again, I believe the word police does not show up in the entire letter. That Um, would be correct. There's no mention of how he died or any of them died or why they died or why people are protesting, uh, anything like that. Also, um, President President Gormley, uh, former dean of the law school, Gormley, um, in what kind of a legal context does the word inexcusable have carry a lot of weight again just like unspeakable tragedy well actually less so than unspeakable tragedy the phrase inexcusable death doesn't really carry the weight that the situation deserves it 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 minimizes it to a commonly known phrase instead of bringing light to a more deep-rooted issue in our society so saying you know um the even if you just said the protest against police brutality that is putting a name to the face and that is actually identifying the the situation that's happening versus just kind of like poking at it and going really tangential to the actual subject at hand don't Um, walk exactly don't walk around the problem address the problem yeah also hey um let's give props where props are due because that's what we're gonna be we're gonna be doing a little bit more of that this time around uh the deaths of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor and too many others that's a yeah, pretty good way to good put it the tragic circumstances bit I would like to be revised saying that you know the tragic circumstances involving the other police involved killings at or the very the, least the ingrained racism or the systemic racism anything that actually says what those tragic circumstances are or any one of those tragic circumstances instead of just saying the tragic circumstances. It's, because it's systemic, just... systemic racism is a tragedy, but I can think of a couple of words and phrases that, are, that kind of capture the picture a little bit more yeah. accurately than the word tragedy. If, if I could choose to summarize racism in one adjective, it would not be tragic. Um, yeah. You know, a, a word that, you know, white girls use on Twitter to talk about people getting canceled um tragic he he subjects or he points to the focus of the rest of the letter in that last phrase what does duquesne plan to do so let's see what duquesne plans to do hey hey hey, just 
more Gorm props here. In the in the other letter, we criticized him. We criticized him very. We we hit him really hard for not saying what Duquesne is going to do. He's mm-hmm. opening the letter by saying, by addressing that. So yeah. And that's something that we were definitely not alone or the first to do. Oh, um, yeah. We I mean, especially the Black Student Union um, really dug into him on doing nothing. So it is a fair and vital question. I've heard many of our Black students describe painful, frustrating, and disappointing experiences, not just in a broader societal context, but right here at Duquesne. The particulars are distressing, more so than expected. I've met with leaders of different social groups, exchanged emails with faculty, staff, and students, and done my best to get to the root of this issue. To everyone who has shared their perspective, asked questions, and advocated for others, I am grateful. Sherlock Gormley, ladies and gentlemen, he's (laughs) getting to the bottom of this case. He's sending emails. He's meeting with the leaders of student groups. He's going to get to the bottom of this. Who planted the racism tree at Duquesne? So, you know, (laughs) jokes aside, this is a a pretty well-written paragraph he is saying that he has been talking to people about it which is the least you can do um but it's something it's a, so the last one was really standing in his spot this one is this is a baby step in the right direction so he's yeah. hearing from people he's learning and I, I mean the fact that he's admitting that there is you know painful frustrating racism on campus and not just like Oh, what's been happening in Pittsburgh saying at Duquesne, that's mm-hmm. a, a powerful thing to say. Yes. A powerful admission. Could not agree more. Yeah. Although it does show a not necessarily shocking, but frightening degree of ignorance to say and to say out loud in this letter that the that the particulars of racism that black and other students of color at Duquesne have faced are more distressing than you might expect is that (laughs) of course it's more distressing than you would expect we are white people we can't understand the trauma the humiliation all the consequences that come Mm -hmm. with facing discrimination that come with facing systemic racism like how could we how could yeah, we especially at a, a private Catholic majority white school? Like, exactly. Like we said last episode, Duquesne is a bastion of privilege. And <laughs> we should not be surprised if a bastion of privilege acts like a bastion of privilege. <laughs> so, you know, it is distressing that Duquesne has a lot of ingrained racism and it sounds like explicit racism, but that's not something that should be a surprise. Yeah, so I guess I guess you know du- Duquesne students exceed uh, faculty and administration expectations. Uh, I guess in this too. Um, <laughs> um, what, yeah, you know it's it's that phrase is is, is overused. So I guess it's yeah. accurate in context as well. But hey, the first thing that any leader has to do is listen. And in the last letter, Ken Gormley wasn't even listening to himself. So at least he's taken to listening to other people. So for that, President Gormley, we thank you. Or as, we, as he said, I am grateful. Uh, he continues, it is abundantly clear that we must do more listening and listen in deeper and different ways. Today, as we observe Juneteenth, it is an appropriate time to commit to doing so. Slight note, mm-hmm. any time is an appropriate time to committing to combat systemic racism. You mm-hmm. don't have to do it on, on Black Independence Day. Just like you shouldn't just advocate for gay rights during the month of June, you shouldn't just advocate for black rights during February or on Juneteenth. There's that it should be something that's ingrained as an everyday aspect of your life and fighting for the rights of the lesser and the um, the oppressed classes yeah. in America. That's we don't something. have to riff on performative activism yeah. right now. But well, we, we can do an episode on that probably. <laughs> but <laughs> depending but the on, idea, it's like, yeah. well, because it's the day that we as a nation or, you know, the day that a certain thing happened or we as a nation have agreed to come together and, you know, devote to this particular or marginalized group, now we can do it. Like, mm-hmm. come on. And There's... also, um, like I said earlier, listening is the first step. Yes. Listening, it comes before taking any action. And it's good that he's listening, but 
there's more than just listening. It's abundantly clear, not only that he must do more listening, but he must do more than listening. There's, there's yes. so much more than just listening. And as we'll get to, most of the actual things that Duquesne's committed to do are just listening. Well, so, like, well, we'll talk about it. Yeah, All right, most, so next paragraph. Issues of race and conflict have been alive in Pittsburgh for a long time, just as they have been alive around the nation. Duquesne has taken pride in its inclusive history, but we cannot do so complacently, as though it is a past achievement we have checked off. The work is ongoing. The reminder of that is underscored in the pain and frustration that so many people of all backgrounds have so emphatically expressed about the ongoing systemic racism that continues to plague our country and every community, including ours. That was probably like, that's probably the best one so far. Yeah, I think there's there's very little um, I have to nitpick about this paragraph. Um, you know, Duquesne hasn't really had the most inclusive history. Um, Compared unless to other you consider, Catholic schools? Unless you consider a third of your students being of color inclusive. Um, you know, I'm not really sure. And if you look at economic breakdown, it's not entirely inclusive. Um, yeah. It's That's definitely true. not inclusive to the extent that the rest of the country is, or even Pittsburgh is. Um, it's it's a skewed racial and economic breakdown, as most colleges are, but Duquesne oh, yeah. especially is an outlier in that scenario. Um, that said, the fact that you know he's saying that it's an ongoing thing that they are striving yes. to work towards equality, um, and that he said systemic racism, something he didn't say last time. Um, that's, that admission is, is good. Maybe it's just because, you know, I, it's just because I have played too many video games, but the, the phrase, a past achievement that we have checked off really resonated with me mm -hmm. because I think a lot of people who are, I think a lot of people who were before all of this happened, who were on the fence in the past or didn't really pay it any attention, pay it any heed. I mean, I did not devote much of my attention to civil rights. I was much more of like an economic rights thing. So a lot of my time that I spent thinking about, you know, systemic injustices and things like that was through like a more of an economic lens than like a civil rights lens. A lot of the people who were more of that on the fence, like, I don't want to focus on this, kind of viewed it through that lens of, well, you know, we have the 13th, the 14th, the 15th Amendment. We have the Voting Rights Act. We have, you know, protections for people that have been held up in the highest court in the land multiple times. We repealed uh, previously disastrous Supreme Court decisions. Um, you know, our country's in a good spot when it comes to this thing. Black people have more legal protections. It's all good. And it's, it's the same people that uh, complained that Obama was dividing race relations. Exactly. Um, when in reality, he was bringing a light to them. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the idea that we, it, this is not, it's, it's, it's just like, a, it, it's, it's, it's like health. It's like your physical health. It's like your mental health. You can't just solve it. It is a process. It is a patchwork. It is yeah. ongoing. So that so, that really resonated with me. Yes. So then he uh, says what Duquesne is going to do. So since May 30th, Duquesne has taken the following concrete actions to move forward and to do a better job to create an inclusive environment in our community. Can I just um, say real quick, these actions are concrete only in the sense that they are actions. Um. They, they don't are deserve concrete. the adjective concrete. They are concrete in the way that concrete is in the concrete trucks, in the sense that they are completely <laughs> Still mixing. liquid and not solid and <laughs> not fully formed. Um, there you go. So let's go into these concrete actions that they've taken. First, we've reassigned a portion of Dr. Anthony Kane's professional obligations in student life to help staff the university's Office of Diversity and Inclusion, joining Dr. Jeff Mallory and Amber uh, Satterwhite in serving students. We recognize the office needs to further review to improve what it can do, but this is an important move we can make immediately. I would like to hearken back to the Black Student Union letter 
the, the I believe yep. it was the concluding paragraph. ODI, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, is great, but ODI is not enough. Yeah. This first point is just, I mean, I don't want to say it's completely disregarding that last paragraph, but also if your first thing that you're going to do is saying, ah, we're going to staff up the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. That's yeah. not a bad thing, but that is a, as you put it earlier, that is a reactionary reform. Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah. throw more money at the problem. Give it more resources. Yeah. We'll solve this real quick. Yeah. So this isn't a get, money problem. Before we get to the rest of this, let's take a quick minute to talk about reactionary reform. I don't know if yes. it's an actual term. It's a term I like to use. Um, well, let's talk about it. Yeah, so I... I stage reactionary reform as opposed to progressive reform, preemptive reform, whatever else you, word you might want to use for it. So the way I see it, reactionary reform is, um, in terms of police brutality, doing things like putting body cameras on police or removing funding from the police, uh, like demilitarizing them, making the LA school, uh, the Los Angeles school police give back their grenade launcher, uh, things like that. I think those are reactionary. They, they, stop the one specific problem from happening again um, versus taking steps to heal the wound that led to that problem happening in the first place. So it's so another rather than restorative. Yeah, exactly. Another example of that is the TSA. The TSA is reactionary security. They say, oh, well, someone stuck a bomb in their shoe, so we need to have them take their shoes off. Oh, someone stuck a bomb into their water bottle, so now you have to have empty water bottles, et cetera, et cetera. So it's oh, they did this, so let's stop this ex specific thing from happening versus taking a more holistic approach. And, you know, it's not the TSA's job to stop terrorism, but, you know, taking actions that will limit terrorist attacks in America, for example, would be an, an example of like a, a proactive reform uh, to that or, a, um, you know, before the, beforehand reform. Damn. Um, so Give this man a textbook. <laughs> Giving Duquesne, so in Duquesne's uh, situation here, throwing money at the problem is almost always a reactionary reform, just like oh, yeah. giving more restrictions on the TSA or giving police body cameras. It's just saying, okay, well, we can give more money to this and that should help solve the problem going forward. And it doesn't, it, it doesn't just have to, be, have to be money, any kind of resources. So in this yeah. case, uh, Dr. Kane's time is mm -hmm. certainly a valuable resource to the university. And they're now just saying, okay, devote more of your time to yeah. this problem we have. Yeah. Instead of actually doing something to try and root out the systemic right. problems that, well, that plague Duquesne. With this one specific example. Two. Yeah. So, point two. The second, th this is something. I don't know yes. how much of a something it is, but let's talk about it. I have created, Ken Gormley himself has created <laughs> the university's first ever inaugural, first ever the first ever bias response team, a group that will provide educational and restorative responses to incidents of bias in our campus community. This group is not a judicial or conduct body, though it can refer to it can refer matters for conduct. Rather, it will work to engage people who act in biased ways, as well as the people affected by such behavior, to help restore feelings of belonging while educating about the systemic, unconscious, or overt instance and effects of this bias oh boy yeah. so there's a lot said or there's a lot of words and very little is actually said there um yeah it I'm, feels like i'm reading the fine print of a compliance document i am very excited to see how this actually works in practice and yes. what exactly it will do in practice is it like because if it's just like du cares which is duquesne's underage drinking program or over drinking program where it does nothing oh you got caught drinking. Now you have to go to a one-hour seminar and then you'll never do it again, right? If it's like that, it's, it's going to be nothing. It's going to be, oh, you said something racist. Well, now you have to go to a one-hour seminar on race. And it's... It would be really, really effective if mm -hmm. this could be a group that was student-organized and yeah. probably with like a faculty, or not Advisor. even a faculty, just like an administration or like yeah. an ODI or faculty like sponsor or like mentor or somebody who just kind of sits in the background like the way that i feel like this team could really be effective is if it was student-led student-run and like actually you know like a like an open organization where you can go and participate yeah. like that would be a force to be reckoned with on campus so actually 
again, in terms of reactionary versus restorative responses. Um, I, we can't really tell how this yes. will act, but judging by Duquesne's other programs, I'm assuming it's going to be a lot like DU cares and that would be a lot more reactionary because it's literally, right. you, did this, you did this thing, here's our response and here's our reaction to what you did. Um, a more restorative response would be encouraging, you know, authors of color to be read and increasing the number of social justice classes you need to take or changing social justice classes so they're focused on civil rights. Um, but actually, Alex, I, I had this thought to myself a, a week or so ago. Um, how many authors of color have you read at your time at Duquesne? Um, you, I think three. How about outside of the Honors College? <laughs> Oh, oh, one, one. My answer is two. Outside read, of the honors college. Outside of the honors college, two. Inside the honors college, I think it's like six to eight. Um, just because though I think one, I've read more than three. It's just, I haven't taken yeah. an honors class in a while. The honors English two class I took was focused yes. on Latin America, so it was a lot uh, of uh, Hispanic and Latino and Latinx. Uh, authors but in terms of like my poli sci degree my philosophy minor and my history minor i've read michael or michael foucault who's a a black french philosopher and i took a class on african history that was it um meanwhile security studies and economics is the old white man's old white man yeah um so I, I've read some old white women too. Yeah, like the the bigger problem at Duquesne, if you want to teach people about racism, don't make them go to a seminar, make them learn about it. We're at Duquesne to learn. So how about yes. we 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 learn at Duquesne? <laughs> into it, it real quick because now I'm realizing in, in defense of security studies, yeah, it's a very it's it's a very new field. Yes. And it's only written by people who have been it's textbooks have only been written by people who've been able to hold positions of power. Yeah. And because a lot of black people, especially in the United States, do not have that opportunity, basically except for like Colin Powell, that's it. <laughs> Colin Powell's the only and person. Rice, I, and Condi Rice. And Condoleezza Rice. And Condoleezza Rice. But she hasn't written like a yeah. security like doctrine. Colin Powell has, and I've read that. Yeah. Um, but anyway that's but but that speaks to a larger point which is if you are in a major if you're studying in a field where it is dominated by white authors and not because there aren't black authors but because like it's actually important to read like the field is still emerging there's still like formative texts that you need to read it's not like philosophy where there's like generations upon generations it's it's very limited yeah that's where the opportunity is for social justice classes to come in where you need these classes to fill the void that is left by not reading uh, black and brown and authors who have completely different experiences that you need to understand as an academic, that they need to bring those experiences to the table. Yeah, and in terms of actually, I can speak more on behalf of more established professions and studies. Um, And like poli sci, there are a lot of African and or um you know political scientists of color class but no i i in poli sci i've read and uh, or i've read an arabic or arabic uh, (laughs) an an arabic um author once um and like i i can't honestly remember reading any other author of color in a poli sci class um and then I think there were a few in the terrorism class also because it's people from the Middle East writing about the Middle East. Right, but right. In terms of actual political theory, one person of color. And then in philosophy, you know, African philosophy is a huge field. African American philosophy is a huge field. But it, I it's never just read not any. covered at Duquesne. There's it's not a covered. class. There's one class called African philosophy, and that's where it's taken. But you don't learn about. The, the only black philosopher you, you'll you read in a typical, like either base level or any other survey of philosophy type class is Foucault. You, you don't and really read any it other. Is a, it, it's a very author. popular thing to 
hate on Foucault. Yeah. But that's not I, because I don't think it's because he's black. I don't, but no, I mean, I don't think most people even realize he's black. Um, I didn't until just now, by the way. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Foucault has some very interesting theories. Side note. Uh, but <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, we're really getting sidetracked here. But Discipline it, it, and Punish is a great book. Um, definitely read it if you're in a philosophy. It talks about how our hospital systems and our education systems and our pretty much our entire daily life is structured like a prison. And that's a purposeful thing to keep people in control. So it's, um, you know, especially relevant today as um, yeah, wow. our police are increasingly authoritarian. Um, it's, it's a very, very interesting theory. And just like Marx, I think the theories are very, very hard to dispute. But again, I've read, pro- I've read the Communist Manifesto more times than I've read chapters of Foucault. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a, not a like restorative how, response that they're taking. This is this is definitely the farthest we've gone. We started off at Ken Gormley's second letter, and we ended up at how many times have you read the Communist Manifesto? It's, <laughs> I mean, it's typically like if you take a philosophy class at Duquesne, every single time, every single philosophy, philosophy class, class, you read the Communist Manifesto, though. Yeah, I mean, anyway, it's an important, it's a super important read. <laughs> yes, but African philosophy, like there, it's such a void. I know anyway. nothing about African philosophy. I don't either. And like, I know. I can tell you a lot about the Communist Manifesto, but I can tell you nothing about any black philosopher other than Michael Foucault. <laughs> yeah. Who so is... that that is where your educational and restorative responses should be in actually teaching from black authors and, and in the fields where there aren't black authors because of systemic racism, promoting social justice. And by and you know, in, in the next five, 10, 15 years, mm-hmm. there will be black authors and they will be they will be heard and we will need not only will we need to listen to them whether we listen to them or not they will be heard because they will be the volume with which they will be speak they will speak will be deafening yes all right let's go to point three and try and stay on track because that was rough (laughs) all right point three in what duquesne is going to do to move forward on addressing racism in the community right now the university raises money to be used for a scholarship, the right, let me start again. Right now, the university raises money to be used for scholarship support for minority students. In the past, that fund has been reserved solely for the purposes of scholarship support. We have adjusted the restrictions so that the gifts can support other activities, including programming, need-based assistance, research efforts, and more to promote an inclusive environment on campus immediately. I don't like this. What about no, you? No, not at all. They're, they're taking money away from scholarship opportunities for minority students and distributing it elsewhere out this of out of seems like a step back out of all the pools you could be taking money from it's not the athletics department that just got a brand new stadium built for it and is getting more given to it afterwards like it it's the scholarship support for minority students why do we have to take money away from minority students in order to protect minor the students who yeah. are already here how about making sure that minority students get the same or more scholarship support and then also giving them more opportunities on campus. There that definitely should... will be backlash against this. Yeah. I've, if there, if there, if there's not, I mean, that's a sad state of affairs, but mm-hmm. if whoever president Gormley is listening to, and it's certainly not us, um, <laughs> hopefully they will counsel him that, this third point is a poor decision and even i i'd be i i'd be hard pressed to call this even a reactionary response if not a regressive response yes um at the very most it's a neutral response because it's it's not giving any so this this point's all about funding but it's not giving any more funding to minority students it's just moving this funding around and this is one place where you can throw money at a situation and it will help. Increasing the amount of money devoted to scholarships for minorities will help the situation on campus because if you have a larger population of black and other students of color on campus, it will be, these are the kind of conversations that will be much easier to have because it won't be as segregated of a community. Yeah, that's the goal in all of this, right? Mm-hmm. 
So let's hope that this changes. Although if it, if it does, we probably won't hear an email about it because it's no. one point of this majestic four point plan. <laughs> so uh, on to point, point four. I have communicated to my cabinet and other groups that we are not done yet and will devote more time in the months ahead and throughout the fall semester to listen and hear what our students and faculty have to say. Well, I think it is important to take immediate and demonstrable actions to address racism, to better understand its insidiousness, and to make clear that Black Lives Matter at Duquesne, it is equally imperative to understand that this is a process. I intend to listen in the months ahead and throughout the fall. Look for invitations to such opportunities. This is a pretty intense concrete action taken by the president. Um, <laughs> first of all, I didn't know he had a cabinet, and all I have to say about that is cool. Um, <laughs> My concrete action is to continue listening. Uh, awesome. Yeah. Um, While I, and, and last point, he did the thing that I was harping on last time, uh, which is sentence construction uh, belies a tone that kind of undermines your point. <laughs> While I think that it is important to take immediate and demonstrable actions to address racism, what, uh, uh, okay when you it's when you start a sentence with the word while in that manner the first section of the sentence is minimized is it's the same as instruction it's 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 the same if you use the word but if you say i like black lives matter but you are immediately taking the value away from that first statement in the same way you say while i support black lives matter by doing that you are indicating that you do not fully support it and that takes the truth out of the words that you're saying it is totally imperative to understand that this is a process awesome um i'd rather not put a time stamp on it because if we by saying that it's a process we're giving ourselves the leeway to move at our own pace whereas this doesn't feel like an issue that we have the choice to dictate the pace on anymore. It's it. And that sentence would be so easy to change if you took away the while and instead added an and. So if you say, I think it is important to make, or not even, I think if you just say it is important to take immediate and demonstrable actions to address racism, to better understand its insidiousness and to make clear the black lives matter at Duquesne. It is. And it is equally imperative to understand this as a process. Like, that's saying, so much better. Because then you are saying these two statements are both true. That's what the word and does. <laughs> the word but says this is true, but let's f- shift the focus on this. The same with while. You're shifting the focus away from the first bit and pushing it on the second. So instead you're saying this is a process. What's that is what's dominating from the sentence. What's even more frustrating is that the thing he's moving the focus away from is that he actually said Black Lives Matter. He did imagine good job president gormley good job you hit it in like the last paragraph but good job it's i i consider him saying black lives matter in this way uh like a baseball game where you just kind of hit the ball off the very tip of the bat and just kind of like peters down the third baseline and you're able to barely get on first base because of that it's a it's a hit but like what do you score that (laughs) It's an error at best. It's it's a bunt, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a swinging bunt that got him on base. It's not it's not an actual. He he did not hit it out of the park. Also, there's there's Alex and I are both in Model UN at Duquesne. There is just oh, I didn't think we were going to bring this up. <laughs> there is an awful awful thing that happens in every Model UN um, bill, especially in beginner uh, groups. And you know, an experienced place. Hey, what's a model UN bill? I have no idea what that is. A resolution. Um, where <laughs> pretty much the first thing you do is set up a committee to talk about it. And the second thing you do is remain resolved on this issue. Um, because that's a lot of things that the actual UN does. They close most of the resolutions saying, you know, and we resolve to remain up to date on this issue or focused on this issue. Um, if you look at this email, it's structured like a uh, like a UN resolution where they but say, written by like people yeah. who don't have enough time to write a like thoroughly well thought it's, out resolution. Shoot, we have to submit this resolution in twenty minutes. Let's finish this. Um, yeah. So you explain the background, you explain why you're writing this bill, and then you say what you're doing in list points. 
Um, yep. That's how you write a model, a model UN bill. And, and look, 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 look. Is they remain committed to the issue and <laughs> more time in the months ahead after setting up a committee to talk about it. <laughs> Look, I can't, I can't hate on a, on a Model UN format, okay? That would be incredibly hypocritical. At the same time, I recognize the fact that that format is reserved for people who have nowhere near enough time to address, the, to address an issue that the, they have. Yeah. This kind of format is reserved for people who have three days to, quote-unquote, solve an issue that mm-hmm. requires many, many months of research and debate. And let's also mention that the Model UN, and for the most part, the UN doesn't have much actual power. President Gormley has actual power. He could make very important changes to the curriculum, to our staffing, to anything. You know what he could do? He could hire more professor. He could hire more professors of color and more black professors, and he could hire them as adjuncts, let them unionize, and pay them health care. That's something you could do, President Gormley. Maybe oh. treat your teachers like the Catholic tradition in which our school is founded tells us to treat They're other not gonna humans. Not going to let us back in the radio station. We'll we'll do it from our phones. <laughs> <laughs> but like, uh, if you want to use your capital C cabinet for something, Gorm. We we have a cabinet. We are founded on Catholic values, and we are not doing enough, nearly enough. We are doing the bare minimum to help the least among us. All right, let's 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 close this out because he did offer some concluding yeah. thoughts. Again, I am grateful that so many have raised their voices, raised awareness, and have been willing to do the work to attack racism at its root. I am prepared to do so as well. While it has been difficult to hear some of the experiences related by our own students and employees, I know it is nothing compared to actually experiencing the, experiencing the trauma, hurt, and frustration they describe. I look forward to working with everyone on this process of learning and improving, for which the measures above are only the first few steps. Warm regards, Ken Gormley. So um, he's going to get to the root of the problem, and also that it's it's painful for him to um, hear these stories. It's it's he difficult. Did, for, he did it's say that for him. it's he did say that. Yeah, I know it's nothing compared to actually experiencing Just, the trauma. It's it's something that I'm seeing a lot online of, of listening hurts. black people. No, 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 of black people complaining that they're tired of white people say like trying to complain to them that oh this is so hard learning about all this. It's so hard. Like I feel so bad about all this. Because imagine how hard it is living it. Yeah, like of course, no shit. <laughs> I I it's yeah. it sucks. It's hard. Yeah. It's like. Man, I hate admitting to my own privilege. Man, I hate the fact that people ha- people's lives are worse than mine and I can't yeah. just feel bad about myself all the time. Yeah, yeah having hard. implicit bias sucks, huh? <laughs> but like, okay, they can't stop being black. <laughs> we can stop being racist. Like, it's <sighs> just, it's putting the focus... Again, it's taking the focus away from them and putting it on him. It's, it's difficult for me to hear these experiences. It's Although, difficult for me to try and find these solutions. Hey, let's not be, let's not, let's be fair. We've been yelling at him for using while and using that sentence structure. Mm-hmm. He actually used it correctly this time. Yes. Placing focus on the second, the second thing that he places yes. focus on by using the sentence construction is actually the thing that should have the focus placed upon it. Yeah. So but he did he did good that time. Again, it just would be so much better if yeah. he just took out that first clause and said there is nothing that compares to the experience, trauma, and hurt that the black students at Duquesne University experience. I understand that I will never understand. Yeah, it's just it's like it's all very performative. There's the the concrete actions. Let's recap this. The concrete actions are get bringing one more person to the office of diversity and inclusion creating look, do you sure cares for will... racism um <laughs> moving money away from black scholarships to support black clubs and listening yikes when you put it like that that's really rough but you're not yeah. wrong it's just oh one person's moving some money's moving do you cares for racism and listening. Do you Those think that he'll reschedule steps. his his uh, his 
legendary First Amendment conference to talk about racism instead of free speech? I mean, it's possible. If, yeah, I, I mean, so. that would be a more concrete step is, yeah. or maybe not even rescheduling if it's say we will also be holding a symposium on civil rights. See, that would be great because yeah. that is literally what a university is meant to do. Let's have that conversation in an academic setting. Let's bring in speakers who can educate our students. That would be awesome. Yeah. But that's not what we're getting. Instead and maybe, we're getting... maybe they're planning it. Maybe they're trying yeah. to get it together and they don't want to and they don't want to say it because you, you never know what would happen with COVID. Like, oh, they don't want to have to like say yeah. it and then cancel it. But you can do an e-conference. Like you can have exactly. a, a, a video conference. I mean, we've been doing that. If you're doing half of the classes online, like we are planning on doing, you can have some people zoom in to talk about racism. It wouldn't be that hard. Yeah. And, and, and sure, look, we're, we're Gen Z. We know how to use the internet. We know how to find passionate, impassioned speeches on racism. But it's more about the act of saying, this is for you, Duquesne University community, because this is an issue that we have to address as Duquesne. That in and of itself is a positive step that actually fits the profile of what any university is meant to do with its platform yeah. and it would be generally beneficial to everyone yeah i think that even the people who might not fully support the black lives matter movement would be interested in hearing a conference in which people are discussing civil rights and actions that can be taken like that that's you know duquesne cannot single-handedly solve racism but one thing that they can do is bring more attention to it. Duquesne can solve, Duquesne can't solve racism. Duquesne can do better to handle racism at Duquesne. Yes. And, and there is more that, there's definitely a whole lot more that can be done. Yeah. And a whole lot more that could have been said that they're going to do. And, you know, like we've mentioned, Duquesne does more to have, have their students learn about Marx than they do about civil rights. Well, that's I mean, where this all goes anyway, yeah. so who cares? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, it's not the best look for Duquesne. No. Um, this letter is one small step in the right direction, but it is not a giant leap anywhere. Um, it's also worth noting that this letter has not, it's, it's a, so the letter was released on Juneteenth. Uh, <laughs> it's not, there has not, there's yet to be a response letter written yeah so they did i i guess that's a subtle affirmation that it's better than the last one yeah um the the black student union didn't eviscerate this one immediately also <laughs> yeah nobody's clapped back on twitter um i guess except for us you know share it make it go viral do what you have to do <laughs> but it's hopefully you know, a sign that a sign that the university community is coming together is there's room for you know you put the two sides together synthesis right. Mm -hmm. If we're gonna take the I don't know the exact word for this but the Hegelian sure thesis <laughs> antithesis yeah. synthesis um, something like that. It's a much more like leftist form of like debate anyway. So if we take, if we try and take both sides, synthesize them, we have to move forward together as a community. That's what I've been trying to get at this whole time. Mm -hmm. We have Gormley's letter. We have the response letter from the Black Student Union. Take that together. And by that together, I mean, get rid of Gormley's letter. Um, <laughs> synthesize it and move forward. That's how we're going to not solve it, but address it. And yeah. I, I, I can't I can't help but hope that this bias response team is going to be something yeah. legit, but your, your, your cynicism is kind of infectious. Yeah. The um, uh, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion announced alongside the counseling services um, that they'll be having a weekly support group for black students at Duquesne. Um, I have no clue how that's going to be, how well it's going to work, you know, how successful it's going to be. But again, that's one more step that they've taken uh, since that statement has been released. Um, and you know, if ODI does more like this, more 
you know, actual actions and creating support groups, that's, that's something. It's not going to actually solve racism at Duquesne, but it's going to, you know, um, <laughs> it's going to help the black students at Duquesne deal with the racism that they're experiencing while they're at Duquesne, oh. which is far from a solution. It's, it's awful that that's a good thing that Duquesne's doing. That's such a, that's such a cringeworthy yeah. band-aid. It's like, we're going to help black students deal with the fact that we can't deal with racism. Like, oh. yeah, yeah, it's, <sighs> not ideal at the best uh but it's again it's it's baby steps from a 140 year old institution uh, <laughs> yeah when you put it like that duquesne is old and moves slowly yeah duquesne's old and moves slowly but way slower than they should for a you know institution founded in christian values that aim for equality amongst everyone well said. So, On that note, we uh, should probably said, end things off because yeah, it is now nine fifty-six on this Thursday night, um, and our time is just about up. Our intro and outro music is by Paul Abrams and Rock Solid Panda, and it has been produced by Elise Duda. You can find a recording of this podcast on our YouTube channel, Catch Fifty Two, um, as well as anywhere where you listen to your podcasts: Spotify, Google Play, SoundCloud, anywhere. Make sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Catch52 and Twitter at 52Catch to stay updated on airtimes, episode topics, and any upcoming guests you might have. We welcome your comments, your feedback, and your suggestions. Stay with us because we're going to be catching up on all the episodes that we've missed over the past few weeks real quickly. It's been a wild time, and uh, we're going to kind of be getting a little bit more back to our roots a little, uh, with, with primary season for Congress uh, coming up and uh, some other interesting conversations that hopefully you'll enjoy. But as always, have a good Friday and a great weekend.